present Dracula. At last, after weeks of waiting, Mina receives news of Jonathan, though he's ill in a hospital in Budapest. Mina travels at once to join him. Dracula. Feel quiet now, Adams. He was asking and asking for you, sir. I wouldn't have bothered you, but he seemed so eager, sir. Almost in his right mind, you could say. Now, Quincy, I must ask you one thing: no surprise, no quick movements. Be calm and deliberate. He was once a very intelligent man, I believe. Mister Seward, it's late for you. I, I do apologise. And your friend? Just a friend. Come to stare, have we, sir, at the disturbed of mind? I'm no more disturbed than you are, sir. Come now, Renfield, that's hardly polite. Manners, sir, are the prerequisite of the middle class and the bane of the natural rulers of the world. You can leave us, sir. I never thought Americans much intellectually. Have you read Whitman? Yes, I have. Well, that may be something in your favour. Outside, here we find it rather pretentious. <laughs> Indeed. What? I don't want to talk to you. You don't count now. Nor you, Seard. Nor you. It's like nothing so much as a hunting dog scenting out game. Mr. Renfield, sir, still here? Leave. The master is at hand. He is at hand. The master. The bride maidens rejoice the eyes that wait the coming of the bride. But when the bride draweth nigh, then the maidens shine not to the eyes that are filled. Leave me, leave me, leave me. Quincy, to the door. Easy now, easy. I know the signs. <laughs> Mr. Renfield, try to sleep. Oh my God! Eyes. My God! Get out! Get out, Quincy! Now! <laughs> I am almost afraid to write this in my journal, but I must. She was there. I had run along the crescent without seeing her, and then along the north terrace. I ran to the edge of the west cliff and looked across the harbour in the hope, no fear, perhaps, of seeing Lucy in our favourite seat. The storm seemed to be dying away, and the clouds racing across the moon were clearing. The ruins of the abbey came into view, and she was there. 
in the silvery light of the moon, I saw a half-reclining figure, snowy white. It seemed to me that I saw, before the clouds obscured the moon again, I saw something dark behind the seat. Something that bent over her. Man or beast, I could not tell. Lucy! Lucy! There was something long and black bending over her. I called out. Lucy! Lucy! The something raised its head and I could see a white face and red gleaming eyes. I ran across the churchyard towards her. When I was near enough to see her again, she was alone. Her head lying back over the seat. Lucy? Lucy? Are you awake? Oh, my dear Lucy. My dear. Oh. So cold. Oh, so cold. Oh, here. Let me wrap you in my shawl. Pin it round you, my darling. Mrs. Westenra, I brought her back still fast asleep with my shawl pinned round her to keep her warm. She was breathing great, tearing breaths. Did you wake her? Uh, slowly, very slowly. And she came home without knowing much of what had happened, I'm sure. She is asleep now, and none the worse for it, I promise you. You are a good friend, my dear. A good friend. When we're home in London, we might see a specialist and ask for help in the matter of sleepwalking. I'm sure it's just the excitement of the engagement. Hmm? I think so too, Mrs. Westenra. <laughs> Nothing to worry over. I shall make sure we spend a quiet day about the house. Did anything happen to make him suddenly turn as he has? Nothing, sir. We were out in the garden. You know, he likes tending a small plot over by the far wall. He was there, sir, and looking through the gates. He was pointing and shaking, shaking and muttering to himself. Muttering what? Some rubbish I didn't really listen to. I was too eager to get the fork from him. You heard nothing of what he was saying? There was a carrier's wagon, sir, coming to the hall next door. We are two of neighbours, it seems. Renfield was pointing at the wagon and slobbering, sir. The master. The master, he seemed to say. And then he turned on me. And I own I was glad to see Jonas and Perks come over. They held him while we got the restraining jacket on him. You did well. Watch him, if you please, and report any changes. I stalked up. He's well. Mr. Harker's well. It is from from his employer. From Exeter. Sit, my dear <sighs> child. Lucy, walk uh, No, no, I'm all right. I have no need. Jonathan is bound again. Was he lost? In a hospital in Budapest. Oh. Nuns have been looking after him, it seems. His mind has been affected, but he is recovering. Oh, dear Jonathan, I must go to him. Oh, you must go indeed, yes. Mr. Hawkins, the dear man, says they have already arranged my tickets and a passage on Monday from Hull, thence to Hungary by train and coach. I'm sure I don't know that a young lady should travel alone. I oh. must go, Mrs. Weston. Jonathan needs me. The nuns believe it would help him. Oh, of course you must go. An adventure. How romantic. <laughs> Would you mind? I'd like to think. To be on my own for a few moments, I won't be long. I'll come with you. Lucy, my dear. Mina needs a few moments on her own. Take the air, my dear, and calm yourself. Much the best. Pack tomorrow and take passage after that. But first, a little calm reflection. Ah, dear Mrs. Weston. Lucy. was seized by a thousand emotions, but above all, by joy that dear Jonathan was safe and in kind hands. 
I didn't care to think about what had caused his illness. I walked back to our little house in the Crescent and looked up at the window of our room. Lucy was sitting in the window, waiting for me. Beside her, on the sill, in the shadows, I thought I saw something. I waved my hand, and as I did so, a cloud shifted from the moon, and I could see her more clearly. Her eyes were shut, her head leaning back. I ran upstairs to stop her getting a chill from the open window. Lucy! Lucy! Very tired. My dear, come to your bed. Oh. Come on now, that's it. In you go. Right. Now, let me let me pull the blanket around oh. you closer to you. Keep you warm. You're like ice. Why were you by the window? Mm. What was that thing on the sill beside you? Oh, I'm asleep now. Mm. Lucy? Lucy, why were you at the window? Nothing. I'm so tired. So tired. Let me see your throat. Is it sore? You press your hand to it. Those pinpricks. Are they from the shawl brooch the other night when I pinned my shawl to warm you? Sleep. You're so pale. And weak. So Painfully, she tries to breathe. Why by the window? Why? She won't answer me. Oh, Lucy. What is wrong with her throat? Lying in that box, looking up, looking young, as if he'd been renewed. The white hair now dark iron grey, the cheeks fuller, the white skin ruby red underneath, and, and the mouth redder than ever. O on the lips, oh God help me, o on the lips, gouts of fresh Blood trickling still from the corners of the mouth and running over his chin and neck. Bloated. As if the whole filthy creature was gorged with blood. Exhausted with his repletion. A filthy leech. There is a mocking smile on his face. There is. See it? See it? Oh, all I remember now is that... that bloated face, blood-stained, fixed in a grin of malice that would have held its own in the nethermost hell. Gypsies came for him, and, and when they came into the castle in the dark shadows, I slipped away. I remember nothing more, only that face, the blood slipping thick from the corner of the mouth, thick, red blood. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. On! Get on! 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 Get on! You want to rest before you see your fiancé? No. Please. You must be prepared. He is pale, very tired, and sometimes a little agitated in his mind. The peace here must help him. Thank God. I thank God for your care. Now, he has been told you are coming. Go in to him, Miss Murray. I shall be in the chapel at prayer. Jonathan? I see that Renfield is at liberty again. He is calm now. There's no point in chaining him up, Quincy. He loves this garden. Yet he's a killer. For sure. Would you chain a dog for the rest of his life? A mad dog, I'd shoot. We can do neither to Renfield. 
He's an intelligent man when his mind is clear. Sure. S say, your neighbors seem to be moving in. I saw a carter's wagon there this morning. Oh, indeed. Well, perhaps you might stroll over there and see what's what. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Can I help you? I'm from the house over the wall. Just a neighbourly visit. Careful, Jack. No drop it. The owner isn't here, sir. Just us, moving in a few boxes. Damn oh. heavy boxes from the looks of them. And to be put in a very precise place, sir. Down in the old end. The chapel? Chapel? That's what we were told, sir. It's a rush job, it was. Letter from a solicitor in Whitby to Messrs. Carter, Patterson and Co. London. Meet the goods at King's Cross. Out here at the trot, you might say. Into the house. Use enclosed keys. Leave said keys in main room on departure. A real chapel in a private house. <laughs> Bye. Not much left, sir. Inside is a mess of screens and upturned stones. And only the door to the crypt in working order. Oiled and locked. Frank, take the end round a bit. Easy, man. Easy. Excuse me, gentlemen. Uh, I shall be locking the gates before we leave, sir, so... Uh... Oh, we're not staying, friend. Uh, you don't know the name of the new owner, do you? No, sir. No, if you'll excuse me. Jack! Oh, Lord, love us. Lucy, my dear. Shall we take some air? If you don't mind, Arthur, I would rather sit for a moment. I'm still not entirely myself. My dear, I really do wish you'd see a doctor. There's no need. It's just the move. Coming down from Whitby to town and Mama being unwell. And we've hardly stopped since you came to town. I want to show off my fiancé. <laughs> That's the truth. <laughs> I've been selfish. No, no, dearest, not at all. I could ask John Seward to look at you. If it will make you feel easier in your mind. It will. I know we both trust John as a good friend. His opinion is worth a great deal. Very well, Arthur. Oh, isn't that Quincy waving his programme? Oh, what luck. Shall he come on to supper with us, my dear? Oh, I'd rather we had supper alone. Please. So would I. <laughs> Quincy, my dear chap. Hello, folks. Good to see you. Nice concert. Yes. Lovely violinist. My, Miss Lucy, you are looking pale and interesting, if I may say so. <laughs> Why, thank you. She has been overdoing it. We have been overdoing I'm it. I'm calling John in for an opinion. Oh, gentlemen, please stop talking about me. Why, well, ma'am, you must be the first living woman ever asked two men to do that. <laughs> I've just been down in the country with him. He has an interesting place there, some amazing people. All mad and some dangerous. Fascinating. I think I shouldn't like that, sir. <laughs> it can make you a little uneasy in your bed. Now, I have to miss the second half, sadly. I, I must leave if I'm to catch the train back to his place. Excuse me. A pity your friend Mina was already engaged. I thought the two of them would make a fine couple. <laughs> well, Mina sent a telegram. She's with Jonathan Harker now and happy. Oh. I'm so pleased. Oh, now, hush. I prayed every night to God and St. Joseph and St. Mary for the poor man. He raved and had bad dreams. He refuses to tell me any detail. Just that he had nightmares and is still afraid to sleep. With you here, he will lose that fear and begin to heal himself. If only I knew what he did rave of. It worries me, sister. I can tell you it was not about anything to give you as his future wife cause for concern. He never forgot you, even in the darkest of times. His fear was of such dark, dreadful things, but it will go. You will help him. Thank you, sister. I wish I knew how to. Mina. Wilhelmina. Is it a dream? Jonathan. Dear Jonathan. My book fell on the floor. Oh. oh, you have been writing your journal. I, I told you I would never show it to you. Jonathan, it doesn't matter to me. I, I believe there should be no secret, no concealment between husband and wife. I have had a, a great shock, and I, I do not know if it be real or the dreams of a madman. 
I have, I have been unhinged, I think. The secret lies in this journal. Will you dare share it with me? Take it and keep it. Read it if you will, but never let me know. Please. Ben, we can be married. I have no secrets between us. Oh, Jonathan. Jonathan. I have asked Sister Agnes to beg Mother Superior to allow our marriage very soon. Now, I will stay here and you will sleep, my dear. Sleep. Hold, hold my hand, please. I am still afraid of sleep. I'm good of you to come up, John. Sick, you said? Not exactly ill or no special disease. She's just very tired and getting lower every day. I dare not talk to her mother about it, as she too is very frail. Ah, yes, her heart condition. She may not have long with us, I believe. Her doctor told her as much. Uh, Lucy does not know. John... I'm aware how painful it will be for you to, well, to, to take on the role of doctor and not of suitor. If you would rather that I'm I... a friend, Arthur. To both of you, I hope. Quincy was concerned. He told me. So, come to lunch, and Lucy will make an opportunity for you to examine her. Her mother must not know of our concern, of course. Taxi! Cab! There! So pleased you could come for luncheon, John. Arthur is naughty not to be here himself. I think, my dear, he'd had a telegram. His father must be worse. Now, you're not to worry on that account, Lucy. He was indeed called away. We were in his chambers when the telegram came. We thought it best for me to come on alone and for him to take the train post-haste. Of course. Poor Arthur. Well, my dears, if you'll excuse me, I, I take a nap at this time, John. Yes, yes, of course. John will think us dull dogs, Mama. <laughs> I think you very wise, Mrs. Westenra. Uh, thank you. And I'm so glad you feel able to call after... Mama. You shall be certain of one thing, Mrs. Westenra. I shall always call when I'm in town. <laughs> Good. Don't tie yourself, child. Hmm? No, Mama. So, we must see to you. Arthur worries too much. You have lost weight. A considerable amount of weight. He is naturally and rightly concerned. Rightly? Are you sleeping? Yes. Well enough. Concealment will not help, Lucy. I'm not sleeping well, no. I hate talking about myself. Remember, whatever you tell me is between doctor and patient. You may tell Arthur everything I say. I do not care for myself, but all for him. Go on. Well, I have difficulty breathing sometimes. I sleep very deeply and wake tired still. Dreams. I, I have dreams that frighten me, and I remember nothing. I see. I began to sleepwalk when we were in Whitby. Really? I even walked out of the house and onto the East Cliff. It was Miss Murray who found me and brought me safe home. Do you still walk in your sleep? Uh, no. I, I just feel so heavy, so... Yes. Yes. I think I was taught for a time by a very great man he became my friend I would like to write to him and to ask him to come and see you he teaches from time to time in Amsterdam and is an expert on matters of the mind I'm not mad <laughs> <laughs> no of course you're not mad I, I just think maybe there is something weighing down on you and it needs to be found now he can help I'm sure of that it seems to be a considerable amount of trouble over a little lack of sleep. Now, you listen to me. He is a most advanced scientist, a philosopher, a metaphysician. He also has a brain like ice. It seems abrupt, perhaps, but is full of virtue, a true heart. I think I'm hearing him recommended, Dr. Seward. <laughs> yes, you are. Well, his name? Abraham Van Helsing. Ah, this propensity for hurry, for rush, for behaving as if... Ants in a heap. <laughs> City's the hive of madness. <laughs> so, Miss Westenra. Ah, yeah, Miss so pretty Westenra. Could I resist the request of my most promising pupil and also the men who saved me by quick thought from a gangrene? <laughs> I only did what anyone would have done, sir. I John, John, do not turn away the gratitude of a fellow human being. <laughs> it's a rare commodity. Now, this girl we are to seek. Ah, yes. 
A girl of such charm and exquisite good nature oh. and such looks. It's not possible to tell you. I sound like a moonstruck fool. If it's love we are looking for, I am home going now. No, no, I assure you it is not. Lucy Weston is engaged to a better man than I. Oh, sure. So, so you say listless, you say tired, you say worn out by the slightest exertion. Yes, and since you received my letter, she sunk much further. She appears almost bloodless. Now, I've tested her blood, and it seems rich enough. Yet every evening she sleeps and wakes the next morning ever more listless. Indeed, indeed. She sleeps alone? She does, yes. And she also had a phase of sleepwalking. And she was brought back to bed only by the urgent ministrations of a friend who has since left the country, a Miss Murray. Sleepwalking dreams she claims not to remember. A Miss Murray who left the country already, so pity with her I would have preferred the world or two. However... We must see this paragon. Yes, but her mother must not know of our anxiety. She is very ill, a weak heart. Uh, it never comes trouble, but in groups like this. So, is her man to be here? He is coming from the country. Unfortunately, his father... Ah, all so sick, no doubt. <laughs> this climate is no good for such people. <laughs> <laughs> ah, we go in. Lucy? Lucy, are you awake? <sighs> Dear John, please don't look so frightened. Come in and bring your friend. The great Professor Van Helsing, I think. Mademoiselle, I am charmed to be meeting with you. But sorry only to find you not well. So, I want to look at you. I'm afraid I am rather weak. She was better the day... And from the patient, I will hear, not from her physician. You clog the issue with too much knowledge... If you please, Miss Weston, uh, I want one word with my friend, and then I will make the examination. Hmm? Uh, John? John? She is worse even than before. She makes an effort on your account, but don't be fooled. What? The great von Helsing? I will not be fooled, as you say it. This girl is very close to an end. I see her, and I know... We have drastic things to do. Her fiancé? In half an hour at St. Pancras. Go to him, bring him back as soon as you can, and prepare him for, for, for something urgent, something we must do for the child. But what shall I tell him? Nothing but to be aware she is going down. Let me caution you. All men are mad in some ways, and in as much as you deal discreetly with your madmen, so deal with God's madmen to the rest of the world. We must keep what we know and what we learn in our own heads to share one with the other. You are afraid, sir. Afraid? The great von Helsing is not afraid, John. I urge you to make note. Learn, watch, rely on nothing you have heard or learned before. Nothing is too small. So... I will take in my bag and the ghastly paraphernalia of our beneficial trade and begin. Get her loving friend. Quickly. In episode three of Dracula by Bram Stoker, adapted for radio by Nick McCarty, the cast was as follows. Mina was played by Phyllis Logan, Lucy by Sharon Maharaj, Seawood by Peter Blythe, and Quincy by Paul Burchard. Jonathan Harker by Bernard Holly, Renfield by David McHale, Arthur Homewood was played by Crawford Logan, and Abraham Van Helsing by Finley Welsh. Mrs. Westenra by Stella Forge, and Sister Agnes by Wendy Seeger. Foreman by Ian Sexton, Adams by Tom Smith. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The theme and incidental music was composed and created by Malcolm Clark in the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. The producer in our Edinburgh studios was Hamish Wilson.